It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a Finish Strong Friday presented by DraftKings, America's number one rated sports book app. It's also a Greg Cosell Friday, third Friday in a row. I think it's a Greg Cosell Friday, the NFL Films guru, one of my favorite conversations of every week. And speaking of one of my favorite things every week, I love giving away winners. I love signing press passes and autographs for you guys and giving YouTube shout outs. It's a winner's Friday. I want winners. I want people that want to win. I want people like Randy Thomas Reed. Randy Thomas Reed commented on one of our Facebook posts, facebook.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. So Randy, congratulations. You are the spread the word winner via social media. It's either at Ross Tucker NFL, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or it's at Ross Tucker pod on Twitter and Instagram. Very much appreciated, Randy. Email me, Ross at Ross Tucker.com. Let me know if you want one of these awesome press passes or if you'd rather have a signed picture. It's like a four by six of me playing for the Bills or one of the football cards, Cowboys, Redskins, or the Buffalo Bills. Sponsor confirmation email winner, Mike Paiko? Paiko? I'm not sure. It's P-A-I-K-O. I'm going to go Paiko, and I'm going to say I loved your email, Mike. I love Mike took advantage of the bowl and branch offer bowl and branch sheets uh, because he heard my wife is obsessed with them, which she is. So Mike took advantage of the bowl and branch offer, got some sheets. What a great, by the way, holiday gift, you know, great gifts are things that people want, but probably wouldn't get themselves. That's a perfect example. Like all of your significant others would love to have better, nicer bed sheets, but they're not like, Oh, I'm going to go out and buy fancier, nicer bed sheets. No, that's why it's a great gift. Love it, Mike. Love the YouTube. Shout out Gary Florian. Gary, it was my first time seeing you comment on one of our YouTube posts, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. So congrats to you. Let me know who you want the shout out for. I just did Kelly Garrigan's for his nephew Dylan yesterday. That's up at youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. One of those cameo style videos and uh, the patron shout out of today craig j marcus we are racking up the patrons and our tuckheads slack community has never been livelier i love it hey if it takes posting the even money uh picks for you guys to become tuckheads and realize how awesome our community is then that's what it takes it's big show time the big show so we look forward to this every week, obviously, and it's rare that we actually have a game to comment on a little bit. He is the great Greg Cosell, executive producer of the NFL Matchup Show, 41 years at NFL Films, no civilian I'm aware of, watches more tape than Greg. And I guess you could say Greg's a borderline civilian. He works for NFL Films for 41 years, for goodness sakes. But what I mean is a guy that was not a player or a coach, there's no one better at Greg Cosell on Twitter. Greg, let's start with last night's game. I'm going to do a full in-depth breakdown after you know you and I are done talking. But I did want to get any any observations from last night. Well, I thought one thing that stood out to me, Ross, was that Seattle clearly committed to running the football a little more. And I think that's important because no matter how good Russell Wilson is, and he's really good, it's really hard every single week to say the only way we can win is if you play great. And their defense obviously has not been very good this year. So with a combination of not running the ball at all, really, and a poor defense, you're asking Russell Wilson every single week to be great. And great in terms of volume. That's the thing. It's really hard to ask your quarterback in this league with all the different defensive concepts and pressure schemes to ask your quarterback to drop back 35, 40, 45 times by choice, no matter how good he is. It's a great point, uh, Greg. Um, And I thought that was one of the big takeaways. I'll get into it. 
in a little bit. But, I mean, Seattle got much better of the game on the ground. Arizona's like one of the best rushing teams in the NFL. And Kyler Murray helps a lot. But that was clearly one of the big takeaways. And Seattle's defense. The other like, yeah, good point. Yeah. The other takeaway t- to me was Seattle's run defense because uh, you know they had not been a good defense pretty much all throughout the season. Obviously, the pass defense had been really uh, problematic, but uh, Murray was not a big factor running the football, and Kenyon Drake was not a factor at all running the football. So th- that last night's game to me was a positive step forward, both in terms of how they played and the performance itself for Seattle. Let me ask you this, Greg. Because I know coaches believe this, okay? Seattle ran the ball more effectively, which means they possessed the ball more than they normally have. Correct. And the defense played better. Now, any defensive coach I've ever been around swears that that makes a big difference in the defense's performance because the less time they're on the field, less snaps, their guys are fresher, Do you see that, or do you think that's almost like an old wives' tale? Like, did the Seahawks running the ball last night really help their defense play better? Well, there's no way to to know that as a mathematical equation. It's not like saying two and two is four. But there have been studies done over the years, uh, and I know I've talked to to, uh, personnel people about this, coaches about this, that do indicate that the fewer snaps a defense plays, the more efficient and effective they are. And I remember speaking a number of years ago with Herm Edwards about this when he was in the NFL. And at that time, the number was something like 62 or 63. In other words, when you get over 62 or 63 defensive snaps in a game, your defense, the efficiency of your defense starts to significantly decrease. So I'm sure... Herm's not been in the league for a while, so I'm sure studies are done like this by teams every single year, Ross, as you well know. this is These are the kinds of projects that coaches and personnel people do in the offseason. So I don't know what that specific number is, but I think as an abstract philosophical statement, it probably has merit. Right. I mean, it, it, it couldn't be the opposite. No, right? no, no. You know, like the opposite would not be logical. So I think there's – and especially because – more snaps for the D linemen. Yeah. Like there's no question those guys, their energy and fitness level is a significant factor in their performance, which is why teams rotate guys through so much. So even like college football, if the D line's playing 60 snaps instead of 85, they're just going to be better. Like every. They, they don't want any of those guys playing more than like 30, 40 snaps. No, and that's why teams on offense do a lot of no huddle tempo uh, because it wears out defensive linemen. So think of that. Look, look, you do college football. College football, no huddle tempo is far more prevalent than in the NFL. I, I know as soon as I finish the NFL season and start evaluating college players and I start putting on a game and I look at a play-by-play, I see 95 snaps. And I go, oh, my God, I got to watch 95 snaps. You don't see 95 snaps in the NFL. No, you absolutely do not. We're talking with the great Greg Cosell. See, you never know what conversations <laughs> you never know what philosophical discussions at Greg Cosell on Twitter here on the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Let's dive into some of these games, Greg. Uh, let's start with the Baltimore Ravens and the Tennessee Titans, a rematch of the divisional round game. I called for Westwood one last year where they got absolutely handled by the Titans. Your thoughts, Greg? Well, obviously, this year's a different year, and you always have to think of it in those terms. Here's what I'll say about this matchup. Two things stand out. Number one, Tennessee has really struggled to throw the football over the last month. And I think one issue, and this is something I learned from Bill Walsh years and years ago, and and he told me that to be a really good offense – your pass game must be able to operate independently from from your run game any given week. It's fine if you have play action. It's fine if they're tied together. But any given week, it must be able to operate independently of your run game. And that's where I think the Titans are struggling a bit right now. Uh, The other thing I would say, and, and this sort of goes against what I just said, but I think if you're Tennessee, you look at what happened last week with Baltimore. 
Baltimore could not stop the run against New England. And keep this in mind, Damian Harris had 22 rushes last week against Baltimore. All 22, Ross, had a fullback on the field. All 22 came out of 21 personnel, and therefore all 22 had the Ravens' base defense on the field. They're 3-4. And I personally believe they would rather play out of their nickel and dime where they can really dial up their pressure schemes. Most teams' pressure schemes do not come out of base. So if I'm Tennessee, I'm starting this game and making Baltimore improve from what they did last week. You know, a lot of interesting stuff there, Greg. I want to hit on the Tennessee passing game point. Is that a reflection on Ryan Tannehill that if the play-action passing game isn't really clicking in Tennessee that he's not able to get them to be able to function independently? Because obviously last year everybody sang his praises. Started this year everybody's right. talking about how good Tannehill is. Is that a reflection on Ryan Tannehill that – He's more a product of Arthur Smith's play-action passing game than really an outstanding player on his own right. You know, and I think the way I'd answer that is this. I think you can be a really good player in a highly schemed system. You know, very few quarterbacks, Ross, as we know, are transcendent players. Almost all, with few exceptions, are schemed quarterbacks. Uh, I think most people probably believe that Tannehill, he, he's got good talent, but that he's probably a schemed player. So I think it's now incumbent upon that coaching staff to figure out what they want to do when they throw the ball when it's not off their run game. They need to define the reads and the throws, I think, more clearly for Ryan Tannehill to allow him to become more efficient. I don't think he's a worse player today than he was five weeks ago. I, I just think that they're struggling schematically to attack when it's not part of their run game. Talking with Greg Cosell here on the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Let's dive into the Eagles and Cleveland, just because I think it's interesting. Cleveland's last couple of games have been so weather affected. Yeah. You know what to say about them. And then for Philadelphia, Greg, you know, you and I both cover the team for different outlets. That was a highly concerning game <laughs> in the sense that they had a lot of their guys back and were healthy. Carson Wentz didn't turn it over. And they still got beat by 10. And, Greg, that was fair and square. That was as clean as can be. The Giants were just better. Yeah. Well, the Eagles clearly have concerns with their pass game. They don't create any explosive plays in the pass game. Um, I think that they're an offense that that probably needs uh, a little bit more in terms of design and route concepts and combinations to, to help define throws and help their receivers. Um, there's a lot of individual and isolation routes. And again, now you could say all their talents back. We'll see how it plays out. Um, I think one thing that we'll, we'll have to see in this game from Cleveland's perspective, we know how they want to play. And it's my understanding it could be another weather game with some rain. We know what Cleveland wants to do, Ross. They're going to run the ball. They want Mayfield by choice not to really drop back more than 25 times. I thought last week the Eagles linebackers, particularly in their 4-3, and we know Cleveland lines up a ton in base personnel. Um, I don't know if Janovich is playing because I think he was on the COVID list, so I don't know what that means. But they certainly will play with two tight ends, and they will play with three tight ends, and that will keep the Eagles in their base 4-3. And I thought last week their linebackers struggled a bit in the run game versus the Giants, and we know the Browns' run game with Chubb and Hunt is better than the Giants run game. Totally agree, by the way, Greg. You know, I, I like both Singleton and TJ Edwards. I think they're better than the guys that have been playing in front of them. I thought it was the worst game for both of those guys. Yeah, I, I agree with you, by the way. I, I, I really did. Um, okay, let's get into some of these other games, Greg, because we've got some dandies. Let's get to Green Bay versus Indianapolis, the Packers and the Colts, what will you be especially looking at or intrigue you in that one? There's a lot to this game, but let's let's focus on Colts O, Packers D. Um, I think the Packers, and I believe they're getting Jerry Alexander and Kevin King back. 
But even with those guys, the Packers are not a high, high percentage man-to-man defense. They play a lot of split safety. Now, they'll match up Jari Alexander at times, and he'll play with man technique, but they're not a high percentage man-to-man defense across the board. Um, So as I said, they play a lot of split safety. They play a lot of what we call cover four with four across. Um, I'm anxious to see how the Colts attack that. The Colts have done a good job at times this year with their route combinations, attacking cover four. I think they're going to need to create some explosive plays versus the zone coverage that they'll get from the Packers. So that, that to me is one thing that I'll be looking at in this game. Um, Anything when the Packers have the ball? Uh, The Colts are a very sound, disciplined defense. Uh, They rely predominantly on their front four for pressure. Um, They're not a heavy blitz team, although they'll selectively blitz, uh, and they'll use Darius Leonard as a blitzer when they're in their sub. Kenny Moore comes inside and plays the slot. He's very effective as a blitzer when he's used. Um, Leonard has sort of become a little bit of a wild card in their defense, the way they line him up now. And I think that's probably a function of the fact that there's more experience in this defense now with Matt Eberflus. Uh, They're doing a few more things. So Leonard, to me, is an interesting player in this game because they use him in multiple ways. He'll blitz. He'll spy. He's, He's a really, really good player. And I really like their linebackers as a whole. I think Bobby Okariki is is uh he's a second year linebacker from Stanford. I think he's on the verge of being a, a pretty big time stud. Talking with Greg Cosell here on the Ross Tucker Football Podcast Monday through Friday. We've got a new show, a new episode for you. Chiefs Raiders, Greg. Uh really looking forward to this yeah. one. Raiders, the only team that have beaten the Chiefs in a long, long time. I think that they might be in for a hurting. What do you think about this matchup? It's the only uh, game in which uh, Mahomes threw an interception. He's only thrown one interception this year, which is pretty remarkable. Um, you know, I think that I look at this game, and and maybe I'll be wrong, but I think you're going to see the Chiefs come out and th- throw the football. Because the Raiders, the last time these two teams played, the Raiders correctly, in my view, played a lot of zone, a lot of cover two. They've actually evolved more into a man-to-man defense under Paul Gunther, but I really don't think they're going to line up with a heavy dose of man coverage against these Chiefs. But I think that Andy Reid in this game is going to come out and throw the football. I think they'll feel like they can protect, and and I would expect that that Mahomes, by choice, will end up with 45 uh, pass attempts. That seems like a pretty decent choice, to be honest with you, Greg. Um, What about... Monday night, the Rams and the yeah. Bucks. I'm a little bit nervous for the Rams with Andrew Whitworth out, Joseph Noplum at left tackle. Boy, I don't know about that one. And this might be the wrong team to go against with JPP and, and Shaq Barrett. That's one of the things I'll be looking at, Greg. What will you be looking at? Yeah, I mean, I think if you flip it to the other side, I think it's really interesting because – we obviously know that the Rams can rush the quarterback. Um, I think Ali Marpet's back this week, which will really help the Bucks offensive line and pass protection because they had a, they struggled one week with Joe Hague at left guard. Then they made an adjustment last week. But the thing about the Bucks is they bring a lot of weapons to the table. I mean, you have Antonio Brown, who's looked pretty spry. We know about Evans and Godwin. Scotty Miller's been effective. Gronkowski's been effective. You know, last week, everybody made a big deal about Jalen Ramsey uh, when he did match up to Metcalf. He didn't match up on every play, but he did match up to Metcalf when Metcalf lined up outside. So the question is, what does Ramsey do this week? They got a lot of weapons. I mean, it might be easy to say, oh, when Mike Evans is outside, we'll match him up on Mike Evans. But then you got Antonio Brown and you got Godwin in the slot. So uh, the Rams defense has been very, very good this year. They're not a high percentage man defense. They play a lot of zone, a lot of split safety. They rely on their pass rush. Uh, This is fascinating to me how they will play against the Bucs receivers. And I thought Tom Brady did an excellent job spreading the ball around last night. Oh, yeah. They all seemingly got six to seven catches. I mean, everybody, I kept thinking, how's he going to do this? Well, at least for that. Now, they didn't punt once. That makes it a little bit easier to go ahead and get everybody fed. But – He found a way to get all those guys their touches, which was very impressive. We find a way, Greg, to get your insight on all of the biggest, most important games of the weekend. Of course, at Greg Cosell on Twitter, the NFL matchup 
NFL Films guru, joins us here on the Ross Tucker Football Podcast every single week. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Ross. Appreciate it. There he is, Greg Cosell. Absolutely awesome, just like DraftKings Sportsbook. Week 11 is here, dudes, dudettes. Let's do it. It's America's top-rated sportsbook app for a reason. No matter where your state's at at this point, just trust me, get on the phone. Just Google best sportsbook app. Just Google anything like that. DraftKings will come up. It's pretty much universal. Uh, They have MMA this week, too, if you want to do UFC 255. But this is the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. A lot of you listen to the Even Money Podcast because you're into the betting stuff. Some of you aren't, and that's totally fine, too. Some of you are into DFS. Whatever it is, download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code ROSS when you sign up and get up to $1,000. That's code ROSS to get a deposit bonus up to $1,000. Limited time, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey PA only. Bonus comprised of a first deposit bonus. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Tux takes. Good morning, Ross. Let's start with last night's game. Seahawks held off the Cardinals 28-21 on Thursday night football. What uh, what did you see out of the game? We already heard what Greg thought. You know what's interesting, Bri? It was a close game that came down to the end, but it wasn't a great game. Uh, a lot of injury stoppages, so many penalties, and Silly mistakes. It actually made it a tough watch, I would say. Uh, You know, the Seahawks marched on their first drive. Russell Wilson did what he did, ran around, threw it to DK Metcalf for a touchdown. And early on, at least, the Arizona D-line was doing a decent job of getting after Russell Wilson. Uh, DK Metcalf, clearly a monster. He had another catch, but it got pulled called back on a holding penalty. Uh, Kyler Murray threw a pretty pass to Max Williams, which led to a Kenyon Drake touchdown. I was like, okay, here we go. But both teams had some guys with issues. I mean, rookie center Damian Lewis, now he played guard at LSU. He's been forced into playing center. He really struggled. I mean, he had a snap issue, multiple penalties, although the one penalty on a deep throw to DK Metcalf was total garbage. He just got ran over. It wasn't holding. No, almost, you know me, Brian, by now. Almost nothing gets me angrier than when they throw a flag for penalty that's not there. Kyler Murray's shoulder was hurting. Uh, Patrick Peterson was pretty terrible for Arizona. He has really dropped off. It's interesting. He was great. Then he had a bad year or two. Then he came back and was great again. Now he's bad again. I I mean, he was really struggling. Tackling, coverage, mentally bad. Uh, penalties absolutely killed the Arizona Cardinals in this game. I mean, how about the end of the first half, okay? Kyler Murray slides a yard short of the first down at midfield on like second and four. He starts his slide a yard short of the first down. And so they go for it on third down. He doesn't give the ball to Kenyon Drake, who would have gotten the first down. Instead, He tries to run for it himself, gets stuffed, gives the ball back to the uh, the Seahawks. The Cardinals have a couple penalties. Next thing you know, the Seattle Seahawks get a field goal. That was essentially pretty much a huge difference in the game, that field goal at the end of the first half. You know, two Seahawks personal foul penalties led to the Dan Arnold touch. I mean, just so many penalties. Drake Kirkpatrick gets – a dumb, taunting penalty um, with Metcalf that led to a Carlos Hyde touchdown. I mean, just dumb, dumb, dumb plays by so many guys in this game. Murray was able to find my guy from Harrisburg, Chase Edmonds, wide open for a touchdown. Uh, But then the end of the game, towards the end, Kyler, the the Arizona Cardinals are still down two, Bri. Kyler Murray has an intentional grounding, which was – ridiculous. I mean, Dan Arnold was there. He waited too long. Then he just threw it into the ground. And then J.R. Sweezy has a holding penalty, which led to a safety, which was brutal. 
Seahawks ran the ball much better than Arizona did. We talked about that with Greg. Carlos Dunlap closed out the game. A sack on fourth down to end the game with a three-man rush should never, ever, 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 ever happen. And as I tweeted last night at Ross Tucker NFL, seeing Carlos Dunlap in a lime green Seahawks number 43 jersey is just bizarre after all those years wearing 96 for Cincinnati. Tucks takes. Some other news includes the 49ers claiming defensive end Tack McKinley off waivers again. The Eagles signing running back Jordan Howard to the practice squad. Cardinals signing defensive tackle Domino Pecco to help replace Corey Peters and Jordan Phillips, who both went on IR. So Tack McKinley, we know that the Bengals claimed him, then they failed him on his physical. Several teams claimed him anyway. They know he's got a groin injury. They don't care. Jordan Howard, you know, the Eagles for right now, I guess Corey Clement went on the COVID-19 list. And I think they feel like they want a bigger, more powerful back for short yardage goal line and closing out games. So it sounds like Howard has brought back to the team and we'll get that opportunity. And you already said why the Cardinals signed Pecco. Tucks takes. Speaking of the Eagles, they placed a number of players on the COVID-19 list, including wide receivers, J.J. Arcega-Whiteside, John Hightower, and Deontay Burnett. By the way, Bri, nobody would know this, but it's Arcega-Whiteside. I should have known that because I've heard that a thousand times, but I'm reading it, and I I just blew it. Yeah, he's, he's uh, Spanish. He's of Spanish. He lived in Spain. One of his parents is Spanish, so it's like, the Castilian Spanish, like C is Thega, or Thega, Whiteside. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I mean, the Eagles, evidently one of them, I think it's our Thega Whiteside who got COVID, and then they just, these other guys, I believe, were close contacts. Uh, that's my guess. My guess also, Brian, is that a lot of people, probably yourself included, haven't figured out what to get their loved ones for the holidays, cannot possibly recommend higher myfrontpagestory.com it's a business i'm affiliated with i have some ownership in i wouldn't you know invest in a company unless i thought it was absolutely awesome you talk to a writer about a loved one they write the most unbelievable story you give it to them or you can ship it to them because of covid ship it right to them in a frame looks like it's on the cover of the newspaper it's awesome it is awesome to be able to say to somebody i had a story written about you is amazing that's number one and then number two when they actually read it there's just something special about them reading it in print how you and others feel about them it's very very emotional trust me dudes myfrontpagestory.com let's do an email brian Ever wanted to ask an NFL player a question? Well, here's your chance. It's time to ask Ross. The email address, ross at rosstucker.com. Again, ross at rosstucker.com. What do you got, Brian? Hi, Ross. Thank you so much for reading my question on the air. Uh, it most certainly made my day. Love that you went immediately to Lieutenant Dan. That was a term of endearment for my Marines when I was a lieutenant. Uh, sad to hear that you don't have a player card from your tenure with the Browns. Wasn't that when you were traded for the vaunted conditional seventh round pick? Anyway, I would gladly take any Browns pass pa press passes that you have or receive in the future. Um, P.S. Never stop singing on the air. I always love that. And Bry's dry remarks that inevitably follow. Very respectfully, Captain Dan Blas, support company commander. And Captain Dan, thank you for your service. Absolutely well said, Bri. I am here at West Point right now. I've got the Georgia Southern versus Army game tomorrow. Uh, two six and two teams, two teams that run the ball uh, really in different ways. It's really fun to watch, actually. I hope you guys, some of you can check it out on CBS Sports Network at noon Eastern tomorrow. I don't really think he had a question, I guess. 
Um, More of a thank you from a follow up from his first question. Yeah, but I, his question right. was, weren't you traded? Um, you don't have a player card from the Browns, wasn't that when you were traded for the vaunted conditional seventh round pick? I guess that's the question. It was, it was, but I was only there, Dan, for a month. They traded a conditional seventh round pick for me, and then on final cutdown day, I really thought I was going to start the opener for the Cleveland Browns against the Saints. Reggie Bush's rookie year, I remember, 2006. And they traded for Hank Fraley and cut me. That was the worst cut of – I think I was released four times. That was the worst one. The last one was the worst one. You wouldn't think that would be the case because you'd think I would be used to it by then. And uh, that was a top five worst day in my life. That was That was absolutely brutal because I had worked – so hard to come back from injury. The year before, I'd been out of the league for half the season. I got a good opportunity in Cleveland. Felt really good about it. Boy, that is a bad, bad memory. It's interesting. Probably a lesson there, right, Bri, that being in the NFL was a dream come true, clearly. But that doesn't mean that every aspect of it is like a dream, right? Like, even your dreams have – pros and cons or downsides that come along with them. Anyway, it sounded very philosophical. Pizza Boy Brewing, DynastyFreaks.com, Sportaculture, SteakhouseSports.com, Vision Comics with an X. Shout out to all of those various, I think we're done here, members of Patreon.com slash RT Media. Have a great weekend, everybody. Please check out some of the other shows if you haven't. And you've always thought, oh, maybe I'll check out the Fantasy Feast or even Money or College Draft. Please do. I think you'll enjoy it. And check out the YouTube page. Have a great weekend. Look for my social media for the Press Box Food. And we will talk on Monday. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.